know that most of what you've seen, read, or heard about Billy the Kid is untrue? My name is Gail Cooper. I'm a medical doctor and forensic psychiatrist. My specialty is murder case consultation for the defense. For 20 years, I've used my expertise to uncover the real Billy the Kid. Researching over 40,000 pages of archival documents and books, I've written the revisionist history. It's shocking, it's liberating, and I've written books demolishing the hoaxes, hijacking the history. My talks will share with you what I've found. Cover-ups, misinformation, and fakery, to use Old West lingo, will bite the dust. This talk continues my revisionist history of the Lincoln County War by discussion of its immediate aftermath. The information is from my book, The Santa Fe Ring vs. Billy the Kid, The Making of an American Monster. On July 19, 1878, the Lincoln County War was ended treacherously by the Santa Fe Ring. But there was a last attempt at justice. Susan McSween, Alexander McSween's widow, like the Colfax County War's Mary McPherson before her, took action. She intended to prosecute Fort Stanton's illegally intervening commander, N.A.M. Dudley, for the murder of her husband and arson of her home. She would bravely returned to Lincoln the day after the final battle, there, she tried to stop looting of John Tunstall's store by ring-eyed Sheriff George Pepin's outlaw posse men. Then homeless, she relocated to Las Vegas, New Mexico territory to stay with her sister's family. There, she hired a local attorney named Houston Chapman to pursue Dudley. Presumably, her traumatized brother-in-law, attorney David Shield, refused. Chapman was one-armed from a childhood shotgun accident. He compensated by brashness. His father had founded Portland, Oregon's first newspaper, The Oregonian. He, like Susan, knew the case would risk their lives. Susan would have also met Chapman's office mate, attorney Ira Leonard. Both men became intrinsic to Lincoln County's and Billy Bonney's fate. Lincoln County citizens' post-war focus would have been on Frank Warner Angel, investigator for the Departments of the Interior and Justice. He'd spelled out his mission in his report of October 3rd, 1878, to Secretary of the Interior, Carl Schurz. He wrote, Under your instructions, I have visited New Mexico for the purpose of ascertaining if there was any truth to the repeated complaints to the Department as to fraud, incompetency, and corruption of United States officials. Angel could have broken the Santa Fe Ring. Angel could have changed New Mexico's history. Angel uncovered the Ring's atrocities in the Colfax County War, where it murdered anti-Ring leader Reverend Franklin Tolby in 1875. There, the Ring's pocket governor, S.B. Axtell, in 1876, had used troops to attempt murder of other anti-Ring leaders. Angel knew those unpunished crimes mirrored the 1878 assassination of John Tunstall and Alexander McSween by ring-eyed U.S. public officials. Angel had the 1877 printed booklet by Colfax County's Mary McPherson. She named the ring-eyed public officials. They were Thomas Benton Catron, Governor Samuel Beach Axtell, and Judge Warren Bristol. She listed their crimes, 
They were malicious prosecutions, shielding of ring-eyed murderers, use of troops for terrorism and murder, and assassinations. They had repeated those crimes in the Lincoln County War. Angel interviewed ring victims. He took 39 depositions. On June 6th, Alexander McSween gave him his deposition, 43 days before his own ring murder. Angel's longest deposition, it proved that the malicious prosecution and murder of John Tunstall were by U.S. public officials. McSween said, the House partners were backed by all the power in Santa Fe. McSween made clear that behind it all was U.S. Attorney Thomas Benton Catron. Two days later, on June 8th, Billy Bonney gave Angel his deposition on witnessing the harassment by Sheriff Brady's posse at Tunstall's Felis River Ranch, and he gave his eyewitness account of that posse murdering Tunstall. Angel was in the territory for five months. During it, the Lincoln County War occurred. He knew its horrors. He knew Tunstall was murdered by public officials. He knew McSween was murdered by public officials. He even wrote a secret notebook listing the territory's ring newspapers and ringites. On July 13th, the day before the final battle, Angel was in Las Vegas, New Mexico, taking the deposition of Deputy Sheriff Adolph Barrier. Barrier had risked his life to protect Alexander McSween from ring murder. He told Angel that he did it because, quote, justice should be meted out to everyone without fear or favor. Angel would betray that ideal. In my novel, titled Billy and Paulita, I had Billy's fellow Tunstall employee, savvy half Chickasaw Fred Waite, tell him, Lincoln County is a moral proving ground. Evil here is so powerful, it breaks people where they're weakest, close quote. Frank Warner Angel broke under pressure of ring backing President Rutherford B. Hayes and likely professional ruin. Ringites had obstructed Frank Warner Angel. He angrily documented it in his letters from his New York City office. They imply that initially he didn't realize that his reports were to be cover-ups. On August 24th, Angel complained to Secretary of the Interior Carl Schwartz about obstruction. Angel wrote, I've had a very difficult and dangerous mission and every obstacle thrown in my way by officials in New Mexico. By September 6th, Angel complained to Schwartz that District Attorney William Reinerson was pressuring him to absolve Axtell. Angel wrote, Reinerson is an appointee of Governor Axtell, a strong partisan and his conduct in the Lincoln County Troubles is open to censure. His interests are with the officials who have suffered the existing troubles to continue in New Mexico. So in early September of 1878, Angel still blamed U.S. officials, but by his October reports, he hid that. By October of 1878, Angel was apparently forced by the administration to cover up the ring by denying U.S. officials were involved in murdering John Tunstall or causing Lincoln County turmoil. Evidence exists that he originally accused the ring in his reports and later edited that out. For example, his report about Governor XB Axtell's illegal transferring of Colfax County's courts to Taos in 1876, Angel wrote, the juries were entirely taken from Taos County, manipulated by Pedro Sanchez, a ringite, and prejudiced by outside influence. Note this editing failure 
where Angel mentions the Santa Fe ring as ring-eyed and outside influence. But Angel was no moral degenerate like Ringites. He also turned over his research. Thus, he gave some future person the evidence to break the ring. But Angel did great damage. To shield the ring, he blamed fictional outlaws for Lincoln County's troubles. That backed the ring's outlaw myth criminalizing opponents. And to allow President Hayes to fake action, Angel scapegoated Governor Axtell. Angel's reward, the month after his lying reports, was promotion to Assistant District Attorney of the Eastern District of New York State. But Angel's conscience yielded covert anti-ring action. When he learned that Civil War General Lew Wallace would replace, remove Governor Axtell, he gave him his secret notebook naming ringites. He gave him Colfax County's Mary McPherson's 1877 printed booklet naming the public official ringites and their crimes. The information was enough to make Lew Wallace the one to break the ring. Angel's lying report on John Tunstall's murder, dated October 4, 1878, was titled, In the Matter of the Cause and Circumstances of the Death of John H. Tunstall, a British Subject. It went to the Justice Department's Attorney General, Charles Devins. Angel slyly wrote, that it was claimed that Tunstall was McSween's partner. Angel's lying by innuendo that a partnership existed was to justify Sheriff Brady's illegal attaching of Tunstall's horses. Angel blamed the murder itself on outlaws, Jesse Evans and his gang. He faked that their motive was an unnamed grudge. Angel concluded, after diligent inquiry and examination of a great number of witnesses, I report that the death of John H. Tunstall was not brought about through the lawless and corrupt action of United States officials in the territory of New Mexico. To hide territorial anti-ring freedom fights and to further obscure Tunstall's ring murder, Angel cited vague troubles and the outlaw myth in his October 4, 1878 report titled In the Matter of the Lincoln County Troubles. It went to Attorney General Charles Devins. Angel made up competing local factions to write. The leaders of these parties have created a storm that they cannot control, and it has reached such proportions that the whole territory cannot put it down. Lawlessness and murder are the order of the day. On October 3rd, 1878, likely under coercion, Angel scapegoated Governor Axtell to hide the Santa Fe ring in his report titled, In the Matter of Investigation of the Charges Against S.B. Axtell, Governor of New Mexico. It was written for Secretary of the Interior Carl Schurz. Its purpose was to fake that removing bad apple Axtell removed the cause of turmoil. Angel concluded, the continuations of the troubles that exist today in Lincoln County are chargeable to him. Hiding the Lincoln County War battle, Angel continued, Again, we have an unusual number of murders, robbery, and accompanied with arson, after Kinney and his party have accomplished their mission of murdering McSween and robbing and stealing all they can. So Angel blamed the Lincoln County War just on outlaw John Kinney. 
his reprehensible fiction was to avoid blaming U.S. officials, Angel concluded, it is seldom that history states more corruption, fraud, mismanagement, plots, and murders than New Mexico has been the theater under the administration of Governor Axtell. Frank Warner Angel actually needed only one report on John Tunstall's murder. It was on Thomas Benton Catron. And Angel did write it. It became Catron's obsession. Catherine had first tried stonewalling Angel's investigation by refusing to turn over documents. Then he denied all Angel's interrogatory questions. Furthermore, co-boss Stephen Benton Elkins intervened personally in Washington to shield Catherine, but Angel gave the report to the Department of Justice. It resulted in Catherine's resignation as U.S. Attorney on October 10th. 1878. Catron's alternatives were official removal, ring exposure, destruction of his territorial influence and ambitions, and criminal prosecution. And the report was never made public. In 1888, conniving Catron staged a fire in his law office to destroy other evidence of his causing the 1870s territorial uprisings. In 1893, Catron got Elkins to destroy the report, and he subsequently denied that it existed. But he failed to destroy evidence of its existence or of his attempts to destroy it. The Catron report's existence was implied in an August 29th 1878 letter to President Hayes from a supposed John C. Rout. It inadvertently confirmed that Angel's investigation was originally about, quote, supposed misconduct of Governor Axtell and U.S. District Attorney Catron. The intent was to remove them. That meant the ring knew that U.S. officials were being accused by Angel. The letter may have been by Catron himself. In the 1890s, he was caught writing so-called anonymous letters to newspapers to defame adversaries. This supposed John C. Rout wrote from Santa Fe, I'm here on a visit to my daughter and have more by accident than otherwise heard statements pro and con in relation to the causes of the recent troubles in this territory and also in relation to the supposed misconduct of Governor Axtell and U.S. District Attorney Catron. I also learned that there is an effort being made to remove the said officers and from all I can learn in my judgment, the charges against these officials have been made without good cause and without the best people in and around Santa Fe. It seems to me that this removal would have much influence to encourage the lawless conduct that has caused so much trouble in the territory. Catherine's biographer, Victor Westfall, in his 1973 book, Thomas Benton, Catron and His Era, revealed that Catron pressured Commander N.A.M. Dudley to give prejudiced affidavits for the Angel Report. Dudley refused. Westfall wrote, Dudley said he had refused to comply with Catron's insulting written demand at the time, Catron's official conduct as U.S. Attorney was being investigated by Frank Warner Angel, that he go blind and certify to the United States Attorney General Charles Devon that certain parties who had made affidavits against Catron were unreliable and unprincipled men. It took a crisis for Catron and Cobos Elkins to do their own dirty work but Angel's report on Catron risked everything. So Elkins intervened 
on September 24, 1878, from his mansion in Deer Park, Maryland. He wrote to the report's potential recipient, Attorney General Charles Devins. Devins was no ringeyed, but Secretary of the Interior Carl Schurz and Secretary of State William Everts were ring biased. Apparently, Elkins used them to influence Devins, and he came to Washington himself for secret lobbying. The result was apparently forcing Frank Warner Angel to hide that his mission had been to investigate Governor Axtell and U.S. Attorney Catron as U.S. officials involved in murdering John Tunstall and causing the Lincoln County troubles. The negotiating was for Catron's resignation without blame. Elkins wrote to Devins, I will be in Washington on Monday next, and if it will be agreeable to you to hear me, I would like to make a statement in Mr. Catron's behalf. With the testimony and his answer and the facts I know, I think it can be clearly established that only bitter political and personal enemies have assailed him, and the charges are unfounded. I've written the president today. The following year, on August 15, 1879, Elkins wrote a letter to Catron from his mansion called Hallihurst in Elkins, named after himself, West Virginia. He reminded Catron about saving his skin in regard to the Angel Report. Known as Smooth Steve to his political enemies, Elkin preferred honeyed persuasion to thug Catron's brutish assaults. In the letter, Elkins used his favor to checkmate Catron in a dispute about their entangled, crooked business dealings. That confirmed the report's existence. But it also showed how close Catron's unrestrained crimes of malicious prosecution, murder, and treason had brought him and the ring to destruction. Elkins wrote, About one year ago, when your enemies were fighting you both in New Mexico and Washington, and your dismissal as U.S. Attorney was ordered, and an indictment talked of strongly, I let every other matter drop and devoted myself to your defense. I never exerted myself more in my life, and I have been assured by the authorities that, but for me and the fight I made, you would have been dismissed. Catron's biographer, Victor Westfall, stated that in 1892, the report resurfaced. Westfall wrote, in 1892, Catron was running for delegate to the United States Congress. Word came to him that his political opponents intended to secure a copy of Angel's report on the charges against him to use for political mudslinging. So by 1892, it was obvious that the report existed. On September 20th, 1892, Catron's past law partner, Frank W. Clancy, worried about it during Catron's ultimately lost campaign for delegate, warning him. From something I have heard, I believe the Democratic management is making an effort to get from Washington everything they can against you as U.S. attorney and prepare to revive all the things urged against you before you resigned. I think you will better try to prevent their getting the information if you can get Elkins to have obstacles put in their way. So Catron wrote to Elkins, then Secretary of War, telling him to stop the Attorney General issuing a copy of the report to anyone. Elkins assured Catron that the Attorney General would comply. The following year, 1893, Catron asked Elkins to destroy the report. Elkins replied that it, quote, could not be found 
That was apparently smooth Steve's confirmation of its destruction instead of confessing to the crime in writing. In 1880, Governor Lou Wallace had confirmed the existence of the Katrin Report in a crossed-out letter draft on February 16, 1880. He wrote to Secretary of the Interior Carl Schurz. It stated, Mr. Katrin is not unknown to fame in your department. He also figures largely, I am told, in the report of Mr. Angel, in which, as late U.S. District Attorney, he was admitted to a kind of head centership of the famous old Santa Fe ring. The outcome of Frank Warner Angel's faked reports was the untouched ring's race to exterminate its last adversaries. That meant the remaining regulators. Colfax County War's anti-ring fighter Raymond Morley was prophetic. He wrote to his wife Ada on August 15, 1878, 27 days after the lost Lincoln County War battle. He stated, in the meantime, the ring seems more and more desperate. If I'm a good guesser, the war in Lincoln is far from over. The Murphy Party say they mean to kill or drive every McSween man from Lincoln. Closed quote. And the ring most wanted to kill or drive away zealot Billy Bonney. He had just miraculously escaped being burned alive, executed by soldiers' volleys, or riddled with bullets of their Lincoln County Sheriff's outlaw gang. At the July 19, 1878 end of the Lincoln County War, Billy Bonney was 18 years, 7 months, and 27 days old. He had become the war's local hero, and his biculturalism made the majority of Lincoln County citizens who were Hispanic his friends. Conceivably, the ring saw him as a risk of instigating another uprising. In six months, local ring boss James Dolan would offer him a peace meeting. But by that October of 1878, Billy was carrying out his regulator manifesto written on July 13th, the day before the Lincoln County War battle. It stated, steal from the poorest or richest American or Mexican and the full measure of the injury you do shall be visited upon the property of Mr. Catron. Billy was doing revenge rustling. Billy was also getting money by gambling in a circuit from Fort Sumner to Las Vegas. But as we'll see in future talks, fate was far from finished with Billy Bonnie.